was asked to do this talk, I was immediately very excited about it because this is a topic that I really enjoy. There are lots of good reasons to work at free clinics. Uh, the particular reason that stimulates me the most is the opportunity to seek to integrate spiritual care in the midst of healthcare. And so I was very excited about the opportunity to, to give this presentation. But then as I began to outline what should be included, I got a bit apprehensive, more, more than a bit apprehensive, because obviously it's a tough thing to kind of get your arms around. I mean, first of all, what do you mean spiritual care? I mean, what does that consist of? Do we have the right to share spiritual care with our patients? Uh, is there an integration of the spiritual with the physical? And you can see how there are a lot of issues to consider in this regard. And so a good portion of our presentation today will deal with establishing that foundational information that must be considered before we actually want to speak to our patients about uh, the, the, the uh, spiritual realm. And I'm sure there are many different opinions represented in this room. And while I don't want to step on any toes, I will represent my perspective uh, in that regard. I want to start, though, with something that I believe we've got in common. And the fact that you're here this morning means that you believe that people are different from cars. You believe that treating a person is different from changing a muffler or hugging a tree. You, you, you think that there's more to people than flesh and blood, more than nerves, arteries, and veins, and that there's more that you want to do to minister to the people that you see in your clinics. So I think we're all on common ground in that regard. Now hold on to your hats here, okay? okay. Here's a quick overview of where we're headed, and hopefully you've got outlines if you'd want to take notes uh, in that regard. First of all, is this appropriate? And by the way, if we come up with no to this one, it's going to be a short class, okay? Uh, and, and then secondly, what is truth? And we talk about sp sharing spiritual truth. What do we mean by truth? How is truth determined? A quick little uh, bit of information in the area of, of epistemology. Thirdly, what Christian beliefs do we look to communicate? Fourth, uh, connections between physical and spiritual health, how the two can come together. Fifth, foundational principles of the gospel, what might be called the heart of Christianity. And then sixth, uh, we'll look at examples of ministering spiritually. Seventh, some resources that you can consider for the future. And then we'll have some time for questions at the end. I'll mention that each of these areas is going to be covered in a woefully inadequate way. Uh, none of this is going to be comprehensive with any of these items. The only way I could say more about certain items is to eliminate others, and I wasn't quite sure what to leave out. So I apologize for that, but I will try to make good use of our time. If you do have questions along the way, feel free to ask them. The answers might have to be quick, but, but still feel free to mention anything that comes up. Just a little bit of quick background information so you know where I'm coming from. Uh, I am a Christian. That would have snuck out eventually if I hadn't mentioned that. Um, also, I'm a husband. I've been married to Linda back here for quite a while. We have two children, a uh, son and a daughter in Charlottesville. Uh, I'm a dentist in private practice. Uh, I see patients three days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, when there aren't conferences going on, and uh, then have the rest of the week for Lackey and, and other, other pursuits. And yes, I, I enjoy sharing the gospel. That's not necessarily an attribute. That's just something that's planted in me, and I have trouble shutting up. <laughs> um, and I do enjoy mission trips as well. I try to get out maybe three to four weeks a, a year on uh, international mission trips. But knowing what's involved in putting on an international mission trip makes it really nice to have a place like Lackey. No passports, no flights, lots of advantages to uh, having a local clinic to, to work at. Uh, and I, I work there, as Jim mentioned, as the uh, uh, clinic dental director, and I'm also on the, on the board as well. And I'm a member of a couple of organizations that allow me to uh, pursue integration of the spiritual with health care. Uh, one is the Christian Medical Dental Associations, and secondly is a group called the Christian Dental Society. Those are groups that have allowed me to meet others of like mind who look to share uh, Christianity both home and abroad. And I enjoy writing as well, and uh, in the CDs that I hope you all have, 
along with a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, is a copy of some articles that have appeared in the Christian Medical Dental Association's journal that relate to the topic at hand, which we'll refer to today, but you can see the whole article is on the CD. Okay. So first of all, is this appropriate? Is it appropriate to try to integrate spiritual care as we attempt to treat patients physically? What do you think? Absolutely. I'm hearing some yeses. Yes. Okay. Maybe. I don't know how you can separate them. They're definitely connected. They're definitely connected. Let's get a little more specific by what we mean by is this appropriate? First of all, do patients really want this? Some do. That's, that's where I am. Some do and some don't. And so we do have to consider the fact that uh, there may be people who would rather try to wall that realm out. And so I think one of our responsibilities in this regard is to try to figure out where people are. On my practice as medical history form, along with all the questions about allergies and medications and diseases and things like that, there's a question that says, would you be willing for the doctor to pray with or for you? And a few people check no, a lot of people check yes, some people leave it blank. But I do respect that as I'm you know, thinking about whether or not I want to pray with a patient. And uh, if they check no, I don't pray out loud. <laughs> but they can't stop you. <laughs> Se secondly, can addressing the spiritual realm help a patient's physical condition? It sure can. It sure can. And there have been studies done that show a relationship between a person having a strong religious environment and better health, better recovery from disease, things like this. Also studies that actually show benefits of prayer. And, and I don't get real hung up on the, the pragmatic idea of evaluating this, but the fact is you shouldn't be surprised that if someone is in community with others where there's mutual love and someone is trying to live a lifestyle consistent with what Christ calls a person to, that there are health benefits. I don't need to go into detail I know that. Okay, thirdly, is it ethical? I guess the way I would try to quickly answer this, I, I think it's a, a resounding yes, but I think the key factor here is, again, with the patient's consent, with the patient's desire, and um, if I can show love to a patient and I seek an opportunity to tell them why and they say no thanks, I'm okay with that. Because they've got to go home figure, trying to figure out what's going on here. And I'm okay just being a little question mark in their brains until their next appointment. So I think <laughs> if, if, we have, if we have an opportunity to talk with them, great. If they'd rather not, we respect that. And I think it's impossible to call it unethical to at least make this available to them. Okay. Four, how can you claim that it's true? Now... This is where I'd like to spend just a little bit of time in the area of epistemology, which is basically the study of truth. And I spent some time <laughs> researching this on the Internet, and it's strange because almost every article I went to that was trying to deal with it in a comprehensive way says, we really can't define truth. <laughs> and you know what? If that statement is true, then that statement is false. <laughs> because they're claiming to know something about truth that they claim is true. But anyway, suffice it to say you can get all tangled up in, in uh, philosophy and all that, but I just want to take a little brief look at how we approach the uh, seeking of truth and how that might relate to both health care and religious beliefs. And I'll say that even though you guys probably didn't think you were coming to Epistemology 101, that I don't think there is a more important component to this talk than this one. There is much more interesting things that I hope we get into, but, but let's try to stay tracking on this part as well here. So when we think about truth or the, the pursuit of truth, most of the time what we are considering is what might be called 
uh, deriving knowledge from empiricism. In other words, what we observe in the world around us. And everybody here does this. You know, as you go through life, you observe, you experience different things, and you draw conclusions, consciously or unconsciously, about the things that you've experienced. And so one might broadly de uh, describe this as seeking knowledge through uh, empiricism, through what we see in the world around us. An example of seeking knowledge in this way is the so-called scientific method, where you would run experiments and gather data and draw conclusions from that data and then come up with a theory, and then test that theory against future experiments. And we all do that all through our lives, whether we're scientists or not. But let's not pretend that's the only way to uh, derive knowledge, to derive truth from the world around us. Because there's at least one other way, which I would describe as deriving knowledge from a credible authority. From a credible authority. So as we consider empirical versus what might be described as authoritative knowledge, let me say first that we rely on both every single day of our lives. When you wake up in the morning, the sun comes up. It doesn't surprise you. It came up yesterday. It'll probably come up tomorrow. This is just a simple example of how we've learned empirically what goes on in the world around us. But we also rely on knowledge that comes from an authority as well. Maybe some of you all aren't familiar with this area, Williamsburg, and maybe you had to stop and ask somebody for directions. And you receive their directions, and you receive them based on their authority as being familiar with the area. So every day we're in both of these realms seeking knowledge, trying to determine what is true. Each of these methods can give us correct information, but guess what? Each of, us can all, each of them can also mislead us. That person you're trusting for directions might give you the wrong directions. Uh, that's an example of relying on authoritative knowledge that might not lead you in the right direction. Secondly, with regard to the so-called scientific method, how many times do you read in the newspaper, science now believes, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> what they were so sure of generations ago or whatever it, it's, has been replaced. How about in the 19th century, the theory of spontaneous generation? They saw this rotting meat, and they saw these bugs around it. So they thought, well, I guess the meat gives rise to the bugs. And somehow it ended up not being true. So let's recognize the potential for each of these to help us or mislead us in our pursuit of truth and our pursuit of knowledge in, in the world. So the Christian view, the view that we get from the scriptures, is that God reveals himself through two means through what he has made, which I would call the basis for empiricism, and also through the Bible, which is the basis for uh, what we learn through his authority. And if you're a theologian, the first one sometimes referred to as general revelation, what we can learn through the world around us. The second would be for, referred to as special revelation. And a question I'll ask is, is empirically derived knowledge enough? I mean, we can learn lots about the world around us, and I am so grateful for what scientists before me have learned, because it helps me to do dentistry a lot better than it could have been done 100 or even 20 years ago. But is empirically derived knowledge enough? Do you find out from looking out at the sunset or experimenting, do you find out where mankind came from? Do you find out what our ultimate purposes are while we're here. Do you find out where we're going after death and why? Obviously, there are a lot of things everybody would like to know that we can't determine merely by observing the world. And so I would suggest that we indeed need to know more than we can discover through observing the world around us if we want those big questions of life to be answered. There's an interesting book uh, written by Francis Schaeffer called No Final Conflict that basically says, yes, these are two sources of truth that we can find, and ultimately they are all reconciled together. Does one source of knowledge trump the other? This is an interesting question. As I was going over my notes uh, this morning, I thought about this guy that I've been meeting with for about three and a half years now, and uh, he was a patient and now he's a friend. 
and he's not a Christian, but we've talked about all kinds of different issues. And if you ask him this question, what wins is empiricism. If he can't observe it, if he can't test it, if he can't verify it, he doesn't want to buy it. And there's a reason for that. And he's even stated, he said, because I don't believe there is an authority that's that trustworthy. Well, I do. <laughs> and, and so I guess what I will say is, back up here. I will say that if Jesus really is who he claimed to be, if the scriptures really are what they claim to be, that is an authority that in my mind trumps what I can learn empirically. And please understand, I want to learn all I can from the world around me. But when you think about learning from the world around you, you're running it through your filters. And your filters are imperfect. You're trusting your own evaluation of the data, which for every one of us has failed. I'm not necessarily talking about science. I'm talking about just the normal elements of life where we draw wrong, wrong conclusions from things and we suffer because of that. So indeed, I would say that if the authority is truly trustworthy, then philosophically speaking, that's the very best source of truth that we can find. Let's look at a couple of verses that reference this. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I think we can loosely understand this verse as comparing those things that we can learn by looking around us. And certainly the Apostle Paul, a very learned man, was not against learning things empirically, okay? But he's talking about relative emphasis. And when he talks about those things which are not seen, he's talking about the transcendent principles that are revealed in God's Word. And that we interpret what we see in light of what God reveals to us. We receive things in the scriptures based on his authority, not because they sound good to us. Okay. And then secondly, to cut to the quick, Isaiah 48 says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands for a long time. Forever. Forever. Okay. So, again, just this last part of this presentation here, I'll say, that the key question here is, is the Bible really God's word, which it certainly does claim to be? And a subset of that question is, is Jesus really God incarnate? The rest of this presentation is based on my premise that this is true, that this is true. You are certainly welcome to disagree with me, okay? But I do want you to understand that the same philosophical basis for my beliefs, everyone in this room invokes every single day, trusting some sort of an authority. And the question is, how trustworthy is that authority? Are we okay at this point? Okay, okay. Let's move on to what you came for then, hopefully. Okay, so what we'll do now, we'll talk a little bit about some of the Christian beliefs to, to be communicated in our practice of health care. And again, don't expect an exhaustive list, but hopefully some that will direct us in, in a good way. First of all, patient dignity. Um, the Bible says early on, it says that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, a lot of you are saying, of course, everybody knows that. But look at the significance of this. If you attempt to derive the importance of mankind empirically, you know what you end up with? You end up with something like mankind is better than the animals. He's smarter than the animals. He's more important than the animals. But you've ended up with a relative value for mankind. And it shouldn't be surprising that that relative value doesn't always let man come out on top. Some people are more concerned with animal rights than human rights because what's the difference, you know? We're just a few million, billion, trillion, zillion years more evolved, right? But according to the word of God, the difference between mankind and the rest of creation is not relative, it's absolute. Man is the only one that is described as being made in God's image. And so you can, you can run in your own mind with the importance of this when it comes to health care. It means that a person's value is not determined by whether they can pay their bill or how young they are or how old they are or how healthy they are. It's because they were made in God's image. And that will certainly affect the way we address health care in our, in our clinics. Okay, secondly... I want to get into just a little bit of medical terminology as we describe spiritual truth here. We'll look at a diagnosis for mankind, um, 
a uh, prescription, recommended treatment, and a prognosis. And again, this is really overly simplified, but we'll, we'll go through it this way. First of all, the diagnosis that Christianity would start out with when it comes to mankind is that everyone needs something outside of themselves. Everyone needs something beyond what they can accomplish of their own strength, of their own knowledge, of their own ability. Isaiah 53, 6 points to that where it says, All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity or the sin of us all to fall on him. Basically, it's another way of saying that man is fallen. That's the word the Bible uses. That there is a moral component to mankind that needs fixing, and we can't fix it ourselves. Secondly, what we might refer to as the prescription would be the gospel. Again, quickly defined, I'll take the verse that most everybody has heard or seen at ball games or whatever. For John, uh, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So that's the prescription, but how does that prescription become effectual in our patients or in our friends or whoever it might be? In John 13, 35, Jesus says, By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It seems to me that consistently, consistently in the scriptures, the motivation that causes people to see Christ for the Savior that he is is the love that they see within Christians. So when we're showing love to patients that come our way, even if not a word of scripture comes out of our mouths, we're trying to show them the kind of love that can lead their lives to become transformed. Okay, prognosis. For the person that sees Christ as their Savior, the prognosis is pretty good. It's abundant life starting now. Uh, John 10, 10 says, I came, this is Jesus talking again, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And of course, that means it doesn't just mean we go to heaven when we die. It means that even in the midst of very difficult situations here on earth, there is a joy to be had that goes beyond circumstances. And I bet everybody in this room knows people who have that joy and perhaps knows people that don't. And I see it. I see uh, I, there's a person in our church who is close to the end from cancer. And, and she's got this radiating joy uh, far more than the person down the street with three cars and a huge house and everything else. You'd think they'd ever need to be happy. So certainly Jesus' words have to resonate with you as you see what truly holds people up and what truly gives them joy goes beyond circumstances. Okay, let's look a little bit about some of the connections between physical and spiritual health as described in the scriptures. According to the scriptures, and we're going to have to move kind of quickly through this, I think. According, let me back up a minute. Many of you have spent a lot of years in courses that deal with healthcare, that deal with science. Has anybody ever addressed in any of your classes the origin of disease? I got through dental school and never heard a word of it. I guess it's just there, right? We just have to deal with it. But the scriptures give us great insight into where disease comes from. It says that when God originally created this planet and created mankind, there was not disease. Disease was not the normal state. But you all know the story. There was rebellion against God, and that brought about disease into the world, among other things. And so the important thing for us to take from that is disease is something that we fight for a while, but not forever. There is life beyond disease. So let's look at a couple of purposes, just two of the many purposes that the scriptures can tell us about when it comes to disease. First of all, Romans 8.22, the Apostle Paul says, For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Paul is referring to the fact that anybody, I think, can look out into the world and say something is not quite right. It's a beautiful world, but it's a broken world. And disease, in a sense, helps us to see that. Paul uses the words, the whole creation groans. It's an interesting term. Did you ever groan? I mean, just inside, maybe not out loud, maybe out loud, I don't know. You wake up in the morning and the back is sore. Oh. Well, that groaning, that presence of disease in the world, 
is, among other things, to say to us that we are not in the state that mankind was originally in and that we are not in the state that we will eventually be in. It puts our experience of disease into perspective by looking backwards and by looking forwards. Another purpose of disease. In John chapter 9, Jesus heals a, a blind man. And in terms of why he was blind, Jesus says, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So when you offer health care to the needy, you are being used to display the works of God in this person's life. It doesn't matter whether they're a Christian or not. You are attempting to restore this person in a physical way that I think can clearly um, be seen in Jesus' description as to why this person was born blind. Why is this person sick that came to your clinic? It's so you can minister to him. God's got a purpose for that. And then finally... Um, I think a critical distinction for us to make here has to do with the ultimate cure. Romans 8.23, this is the verse after the one I referenced previously. It says, and not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. So this points to the future that we've been promised, that as Christ has been raised from the dead, so we too can look forward to new bodies that would last for eternity. So yes, we fight disease, but not forever. Okay. Let's look now at some of the foundational principles of the gospel. And um, by this, let me make a little distinction here. There are lots of elements of spiritual truth that we can share with our patients that can hopefully minister to them. But the central element of that is sometimes referred to as the gospel, the good news. Even if I had all the time in the world, I can't build a box around it because it's bigger than I am. It's bigger than we are. But we're going to look at some of what I would call the central principles as to what the gospel consists of and how we can share that with patients and others in a way that respects what the Bible calls us to. First of all, these first two verses, just a, a quick attempt to summarize this huge thing called the gospel. If I only had one verse to share with a patient, this would be it. Um, because it's so much, there's so much packed into it. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I love this verse because when you, you talk about wages, everybody knows what wages are. Wages are what you receive because of what you have done, what you have earned what you deserve from what you've done. And so the scriptures say that what we deserve because of the fact that we're all sinners is death, meaning not necessarily immediate physical death, although death came into being because of sin, but what we deserve is separation from God. And then the mind-blowing thing, which I was 24 before it really made sense to me, is that eternal life in Christ Jesus, Jesus our Lord is actually a free gift. Now, if any of you all um, are hearing this for the first time and think it's too good to be true, uh, it's true. I will, excuse me, I will at least say it is consistent with what the scriptures say. You've got to decide whether, for yourself whether it's true or not, okay? Whether that authority is trustworthy. But uh, this is a mind-blowing thing. And this truth has the potential to mislead us if we don't rightly understand it. So we've got to add at least one, ver one more verse to this thing here real fast, okay? It does say that by faith we can receive this free gift of salvation in Christ. But the scriptures also say in multiple places that faith in Christ carries with it implications, implications of that faith. A good place to go to, to recognize that is James 2, 17, where James says, even so faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. If true faith exists, there will always be uh, an observable change in that person's life because of that faith. So we think about faith in Christ, which is a free gift, and we think about the works that we do. They are both absolutely essential for a person who is seeking to follow Christ. Okay, They're both essential, but the order is to be clear. That being right with God is based on faith in Christ plus Nothing, plus nothing. If it's faith in Christ plus what I do, then you know what I'm really saying? 
I'm saying that Christ didn't do enough. I've got to add a little bit more to, to kind of get over the wall or whatever, okay? So being right with God is faith in Christ plus nothing, okay? But if a person truly belongs to Christ, they will want to live in such a way that, that they will honor him. Can I add one thing, though? Please, go ahead. That I think gets, but the faith is the work of the Spirit. Yes, it is. I just want to add. Amen. I wish we could fit some more verses up here. I really do. You're exactly right. And that's why, and that's why it says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, by grace are you saved through faith. It is a gift of God. Because even our faith is, is by grace. That's a good distinction to make. Um, oh, we got to well, oh, no, one, 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 more, one more thing, one more thing, and that is, I want I want to be careful that we don't see the last verse as the good news and this verse as the bad news. We can do that if we're not careful. Well, it's good that I'm going to heaven, but oh darn, I got to live a good life now, okay? Because the fact of the matter is, we see in the scriptures in in Romans six it says the same power that raised Christ from the dead enables us to walk in newness of life. So the work of God in Christ is not just to erase our sins. It's to make us holy. You see that in 2 Corinthians 5, 21 too, That we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. So it's a whole package deal. It's eternal life with God, and it's the power to overcome sin in our lives that we could not overcome otherwise. Okay, quick story from a mission trip to Jamaica a couple years ago. A guy named Jolliver, who I had seen multiple times. I... I go to Jamaica usually every March and July for a week each time. And this guy, Jolliver, uh, I see him at the beginning of another trip a couple years ago, and he says, hey, Bill, I want you to know I'm almost ready to, to receive Christ. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it blew me away for a couple reasons. One is I'd seen Jolliver a lot, you know, but we had, I don't remember having in-depth spiritual discussions with him. I don't think we did. But, but I was just really curious. And so at the end of that day's clinic, I said, so, Jolliver, tell me a little bit more. And he says, well, I'm almost ready but there are just a couple things I need to clean up first. <laughs> and, and think about this for a minute here, okay? On the one hand, on the one hand, I rejoiced that he sees a call to Christ as a call to holiness. After we talked longer, he told me, you know, his mother and his sister were Christians, and he saw that they were different from him. And I praise God that he sees Christ being a call to holiness, okay? But the misunderstanding he had was he thought he had to clean up his act in order to get there. And if you did, none of us in this room would have faith in Christ, okay? We, we know that it's through faith in Christ that we are empowered to lead that kind of a life that God wants us to live. Okay. Okay. 1 Peter 3.15. Again, this is a, a verse that's loaded with things. In fact, that's my license plate, 1 P-E-T-3-1-5. It says, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. All I'm going to pull out of this is, when it says sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, those are words we don't use a lot in our culture, sanctify Lord and all that. But to sanctify means to set Christ apart as the boss of our hearts. We know that our hearts can get pushed in all kinds of directions by all different kinds of forces. Uh, riches, uh, popularity, whatever it might be. And what Peter is saying here is that you want Christ to be the strongest voice in your heart. You want that, uh, that desire to serve him to predominate over all the other desires, good or bad desires that we might have. And it's as you're doing that, he says, get ready, because somebody may just indeed ask you what's going on in there. If you indeed desire to see Christ as the strongest power in your life, then people are going to wonder, what's charging your battery? What's giving you the ability to love me? I know, because that's why I came to Christ in dental school. I saw people who had a love that I didn't have. They had a joy I didn't have. They were sanctifying Christ as Lord in their hearts. And so let's see the connection between pursuing a Christ-like life and receiving opportunities to tell people why we do it. Because I don't know that you can really separate the two. Bill, before you go on, can I jump in? If you can go fast. I'm sorry. Could we go? In the King James Version, I think that, that words are better. In, um, in humility and trembling or fear is how you share that. And um, yeah. instead of gentleness and reverence. I wish they'd left these two words out, actually, because no, that's a hard for me. <laughs> I know, just you, you, I mean, 
my personality is just like this. I want to jump on people and beat them. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and that is, is so tempting. Yeah. This is the way that it has to be done. Sorry. Okay, okay, okay. thank you. All right. First John 4.19, not a real complicated verse. It just says we love because he first loved us. But I don't know a more profound theological truth in all the scripture than this. That it's our desire to show people the love that we have received. The most theologically profound hymn in every hymnal is, Jesus loves me, this I know. And if you ever have that one totally figured out, totally applied to your life, call me. Because to me, that's the one that just keeps growing in, in manifestations, keeps growing in applications in our, in our lives. Okay. All right. Another thing that I think is important to keep in mind, especially in a, in a Christian, in a faith-based clinic, is something that Jesus prayed shortly before he died. This is in the middle of what's called his high priestly prayer. He's, played for, he's prayed for his disciples. And then he says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word. Who's that? That's us. That's us because we got it through their word passed down over the generations. That they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Among other things, this is saying that Jesus prayed for a unity of his followers that would resemble the unity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which is pretty good, I think, because they've been together for all eternity. Okay? <laughs> and, and that the unity that we seek to have in Christ would be the power that the non-believing world sees that would convince them that Jesus really is who he claimed to be, that he really is the, the Messiah. And so the way I'll apply this is if I see a patient through Lackey, it may be their first dental appointment, but they may have been to the clinic three or four times previously in medical, and they'll talk about how well they were treated and how nice people were to them. And they've already seen love. Maybe they don't know where that love comes from. And often I'll say to them, so why do people treat people for free around here? Why do they do that? And just to kind of get them thinking what's going on. But it's the corporate witness of Christians that so often causes a per person to, uh, to come to Christ. And when that happens, recognize it as an answer to Jesus' prayer 2,000 years ago. Okay. 1 Corinthians 3, 6 says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. Okay. I want to mention here, um, we'll get more into this shortly, but there's a series put out by the Christian Medical Dental Association it's called The Saline Solution. It's a course about how to share the gospel in healthcare. And they've given seminars, they have it on video. We're going to see an excerpt from the video here before we're done, if I keep moving. Um, but what I want to share with you about this is, obviously this talks about, the verse talks about how coming to Christ and growing to Christ is a process. It's not necessarily an instantaneous event unless your name is the Apostle Paul. Even then it took a little while. But so on the inside cover of this book, The Saline Solution, is a chart which shows artificial stages that a person could go through in going from not being a Christian to being a Christian who's growing with the Lord. It goes from negative 12 to positive five, okay? And we'll look, I, I wanted to show you the whole chart because we're going to see excerpts of it on the slides here. So start at the bottom. Minus 12, you've got a cynic here who avoids the truth, who thinks Christianity is a crock, wants nothing to do with it, thinks Christians are idiots, it's just as far south as you can be, okay? And then perhaps they come across somebody who's not quite as crazy as the rest, and they start to get a little bit aware of the messenger, like a pretty nice person, you know, nice neighbor, whatever it might be, whatever the influence might be. And they begin working their way up the chart here. And so they go from being a cynic who thinks it's all crazy to a skeptic. I don't think so. And then somebody else shows them the love of Christ, and they move from being a skeptic to a spectator. They're, they're not getting too close yet, but they're starting to watch a little bit more. And you see them moving up the ladder again. 
And then they go from being a spectator to seeing something they want to pursue, and they become a seeker. They, they actively pursue information about Christianity. And then at some point, by God's grace, perhaps they trust in, in Christ. And then there are steps that they can go to grow in too. So why is this important? I think it's pretty self-evident that however you might show the love of Christ to patients or share spiritual truth, I guess that's the title of the talk. That's the politically correct title of the talk. However you might show love to your patients may be something to move them up a notch. And don't go home disappointed if they haven't bowed the knee to Christ quite yet. Fast answer. It, they show that uh, most people come to Christ after they've had seven positive contacts with Christians. What another reason for the clinic? Yeah, yeah good point, good point. Okay. Okay, and then I think this is the last one of the, the foundational principles of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 4, 7 says, What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? This is obviously the call to humility. Um, which we have to be really careful about, okay? Because I'm sure you've talked, if you talk to non-Christians about such things, I'm, re- I'm sure you've talked to non-Christians who will say, well, Christians seem so arrogant. They seem so sure of themselves. And there's two possibilities, okay? Maybe they are arrogant. Maybe they're condescending towards non-Christians. Should I say we? I shouldn't say they. Maybe. Uh, certainly at times, we do pretend as though our faith in Christ is something that we have somehow generated. We wouldn't verbally assent to that, but that attitude comes across. The other possibility is maybe we're just really excited because we want them to have something that we know is really precious. And the non-Christian can't always tell the difference. But let's guard against the first and let's enjoy the second. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. There is one more verse. Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. This is critical because of the fact, remember that chart, early on, Skeptics may not necessarily appreciate our efforts. And we're going to see a story in just a couple minutes where this very thing happens. So save this verse and all the others too. You know, but, okay. Okay, this is the part that I was really looking forward to. Now we're going to look a little bit more at concrete examples of how we can communicate the gospel, uh, how we can communicate the truth of Christianity with our patients. Okay, first of all, just a couple things, um, examples of some things that I might say to patients during the course of a day. No big deals, but uh, if I see a healthy patient in hygiene uh, and they're all finished for six months, I might say to them, well, it looks like the Lord's blessed you, everything's in great shape, see you in six months. No big deal, no conversation stoppers, just a reference to the fact that uh, the truths of Christianity are an integral part of life. They're referred to in the Saline Solution course as faith flags, just illustrations of your faith in the Lord that don't necessarily put the patient on edge or make them defensive. It's just general comments they may or may not pick up on. In fact, you might find out that people are Christians through raising these kinds of faith flags. Okay, with TMJ patients, one of the most common reasons for TMJ trouble is clenching and grinding the teeth. And clenching and grinding teeth quite often is caused by stress, stress. Well, there's this verse in Philippians 4, 6 where it says, don't be anxious, but pray. It says more than that. But the implication there is you can be anxious, you can pray, but you can't do both at the same time. So I will sometimes share this with a patient that, you know, perhaps if you could consider what it is that might be contributing to your anxiety and pray about things, perhaps the Lord will help you to overcome them. Again, you don't want these necessarily to be conversation stoppers, but it's ways that the Word of God practically applies to situations we come up to in, in healthcare. care. Uh, offering to pray, I mentioned the health history form, which lets you know whether or not that's appropriate. That's kind of a tricky one, though, because sometimes I hesitate to pray with patients because I'm thinking they'll think, oh, my gosh, he must have really messed up. He's praying for me now. But, <laughs> but I mean, you have to kind of pick your spots, I guess. Um, when I mention the importance of home care here, sometimes especially with children, not just children, but we all tend to be not as grateful as we should be for the things that we have. So I'll mention to a child sometime, I'll say, you know, the Lord gave you a great set of teeth. And perhaps the best way you can show your gratefulness for those teeth is to take good care of them. So again, so they see taking care of their teeth as a response to what the Lord has done for them. 
questions you can ask down here, just general questions about people's lives that will find out what their value system is, what they value the most, and what's important to them, and might open some doors to discussing spiritual truth with them. Things like, what does it take to have a happy marriage? How do you raise good kids? Uh, what do you think happens when life on earth is over? That's a little bit more, you know, <laughs> pointed. It wouldn't be the first question I'd ask. But uh, there's a, some of you all are probably familiar with a series by D. James Kennedy called Evangelism and Explosion, which has two great, what he calls, diagnostic questions as to where somebody is. And um, the first one is, have you come to the point in your spiritual life where you know for certain that if you die tonight, you would go to heaven? And uh, the second one is, if you were to die tonight and stand before God and God said to you, why should I let you into heaven, what do you think that you might say? And you can kind of find out where somebody is, at least intellectually, with those two questions. And I don't pretend like if you can't get them right, you're not a Christian. I don't pretend like if you've got them right, you are a Christian. But it's, it's something to bring about discussion along these lines. Okay, now... This is a patient named Crystal, who uh, I had the privilege of seeing for the last, I guess, 12 years or so. She first came to me when she was about 16 years of age, and uh, she had a pretty high decay rate. You you have a copy of this article in your CDs. She had a pretty high decay rate, so we saw a lot of each other. And then she stopped coming for a while, except she would come when she had severe pain. And she would come seeking relief from that pain, uh, often in the form of a prescription. And I became a little bit wary about whether or not these requests were legitimate. But this puts a practitioner in a very tough situation. How do you look somebody in the face and say, no, you don't hurt? I mean, so it's a hard thing to do. But eventually, I came to the conclusion I needed to cut her off. And I wrote Crystal a letter. And uh, it basically said, I'm sorry, but I can't give you any more prescriptions. If you won't give me a chance to treat the problems that go on, you're going to have to find somebody else that will. I basically dismissed her from my practice. Very soon thereafter, she was in a car accident. And um, I'm not sure what else happened, but I guess you would say she hit the proverbial rock bottom. And through others that ministered to her, she professed faith in Christ. And then she came back to my office, and I had the privilege of seeing a truly new creation in Christ. And, and the joy in her life was just a beautiful thing to see. And we're going to see a couple excerpts in the article here that I want to share with you. Um, She mentioned, I had a lot of teaching on the gospel. I understood the gospel. I just didn't make it personal. Years before her conversion, I had given her a copy of a book by Josh McDowell, More Than a Carpenter. It's sort of, you know, gospel light. It's a great book, but it's it's not going to overwhelm anybody theologically. It's really to the heart of what it means to belong to Christ. And I had forgotten I gave it to her. She reminded me. She, She said she read it, and that enabled her to understand the gospel intellectually, but she didn't receive it personally for a while later. But this next slide I really want you to see. I asked Crystal near the end of the interview, I said, Crystal, do you have any advice for Christian doctors regarding how they can best minister to their non-Christian patients? (coughs) And I'll read this for you here if you can't see it. It says, I would say to let the light in them shine through. You know, what you guys do so well here. She's talking about the staff. We got a great staff. Because it just shines right through you. Even with all the business that's going on and all you have to do, you still have that light shining through you. A person can see God all over you. And that warms even someone who is not a Christian. It warms their heart. I know they've got to feel it. So in everything that you do, do it so that it glorifies God. Then the love of God for others will shine through you And even if your patient is angry, they will still see it and want it for themselves. Remember that verse that said, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. (laughs) She's telling me now she was angry when we would try to show love for her. But even in the midst of her anger, she saw something in our staff, something in our team that, that kept that door open. And it was when she realized she couldn't control the circumstances of her life that Christ came in. So you're laying groundwork, and you just don't know where it's going, but it's exciting to to think about. Okay. I'll mention very quickly also, I have an employee who uh, who, um, something occurred that shouldn't have happened, and through confronting this employee, 
she also came to Christ. I'm going to cut it right there. You, but you have an article again in your CDs about confronting employees biblically. Uh, and you see how it doesn't just have to be employees, but when something goes wrong with someone, if you seek to reconcile that wrong in an appropriate way, even that can be an occasion for the gospel to, to go forth. We're moving on. Okay. There is a. Uh, hang on, just a second. Let me just introduce this. There is a uh, staff member at Lackey who's been working at Lackey for about five years in the receptionist area, and um, it was about four years ago that she professed faith in Christ. And so we're going to hear a little bit about her story, and uh, some of the excerpts of the audio will be on the the uh, screen here, but you have to listen real closely because it's not extremely loud. So. The funniest part of my story is I've lived just two minutes away from the clinic, and I passed for the whole year, every day, every day. And I never, you know, didn't care to know what was lucky for clinic. Yeah. I mean, until my mom comes to my house and she needs medical help. That's how I come to the clinic. Is that right? Yes, I've, I've completed a volunteer application. <laughs> Because I'm, I speak Spanish, so let me do something. I don't do nothing on Thursday night. Let me help people that need some help. You know, let me do something different. And I went home with a job interview that night. When I started working here, I call it my step to heaven. Because that's how I felt. Wow. Even though I was not saved, mm -hmm. I call it my step to heaven. Because it was so different for me. I never worked in... Christian environment, mm -hmm. and not only that, for me it was so big. See all those rich people mm. coming and volunteer just because they love the Lord, instead of being having fun, retired. And yes, just because they love the Lord, yeah. they come and help with the love, and they really show the love to the patients. Just all, seeing all these people, this doctor willing to help, and Dr. Shaw, Miss Cook, being here, and it was just—I I can't find words to explain. It was just a pro. I guess it was a process. Like I mentioned before, when you come from a poor country, where you were poor, poor, rich, rich, nobody does does nothing for you, nothing is free, but here is free and it's with love. But, and he asked me, do you want to accept him? And I say, I think I'm not ready. Month passed and in August 10th, 2006, I was a Thursday night walking clinic. I was really emotional and I just go in and said, done, today's the day, I'm ready. Really? And in the same room where we are right now, really? we pray the prayer. Wow. And yeah, yeah, it was really, I was really emotional that night. Okay. Neat story. And this is the story of somebody in this room. Say hello. Thank you. <laughs> That means a whole lot more than all the verses somebody can quote. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. A couple other examples of ministering spiritually. Um, as I mentioned, I like to go on medical dental mission trips, and I did write an article for Christian Medical Dental Association. It's called 10 Reasons for Mission Trips. And you've got a copy of that on your CDs as well. And um, this is a trip to Nigeria where I was actually teaching Nigerians how to do dentistry. They weren't dental students. They were just Nigerian Christians. <laughs> they had one week to learn what I took four years to learn. It was an interesting week. Uh, and then here's a picture of um, Kathy O'Connell, OBGYN, who uh, works at Lackey as well. But anyway, what I wanted to get to was, of these 10 reasons to go on short-term mission trips, 
I reviewed those 10, and eight of the 10 are very possible at a local free clinic. So a lot of great opportunities right here. Okay, we'll look at a couple of uh, resources that we can consider for the future. I mentioned the, uh, the Saline Solution Seminar. It's been given live in a number of different places. Um, and also, they have a video series that we're about to see an excerpt from. And um, the video is a bit dated. It's probably like about 15 years old or so. But it's still got great uh, content for it. So we'll take a look uh, at the video here. But I'll mention the, the general course of the video, if you want to uh, pursue it. There are two people who lead the series, Walt Larimore, a physician, and Bill Peel, who's a, a pastor. And then throughout the video, they show dramatic representations of these three doctors that are trying to share their faith with their patients and some of the miserable results and some of the exciting results. So it's, it's, it's real life. You see apprehensions that people naturally have and then you see how they overcome these apprehensions and some of the ways that God can bless their efforts. So what we're going to look at now is an excerpt from towards the end of the video series and we're going to see one doctor who's treating a mother and then the doctor's wife who's also a doctor who's treating the daughter. And both of them were very cold towards the things of Christ initially and they're starting to warm up a little bit. So with that introduction, let's see it here. So is there any pain at all? Not much. Maybe a little after I've been on it a while, but it's no problem. Good, I'll tell you what, let's forget about that brace altogether. Sounds good. Anything else? No. Although I did take your suggestion. Oh, uh, which ones? I'm reading the Bible. You'll be glad to know I actually own one. Really? Why, and how's it going? Okay. Until I run across one of those stories about water changing to wine or feeding 5,000. Excuse me for being so blunt, but you're an intelligent person. How can you take this seriously? Tell me, how would you answer Mrs. Wells? Well, try this one on for size. Karen, I believe the Bible, and that settles it for me. The Bible is God's word, and we have no right to doubt what it says. You know, that's the problem with this country, and that's probably why Carol is having so much trouble, because you don't take God seriously. Well, where do you think that would take the conversation? Hmm. I'll tell you what. Let's see if Ken has a better way to answer Mrs. Wells' objection. Why, and how's it going? Okay. Until I run across one of those stories about water changing to wine or feeding 5,000. Excuse me for being so blunt, but you're an intelligent person. How can you take this seriously? If it was a story about uh, you or me, then I would have my doubts. But if Jesus is who he says he is, the Son of God, then I would be surprised if he wasn't performing miracles. Bill, I tell you what, I think we have to hand it to Ken. Yep. Because I think he did a really good job with that. Because whenever a negative reaction comes along, it's real easy to overreact. I tell you what, Bill, I ought to know. <laughs> well, as you deal with objections, it's important not to react negatively. But also, don't miss the value of doubt. Now, that may sound strange coming from a theologian, but doubt is really the doorway to faith. So, anyway, after you told me about reading the Bible and it helping you and all, I decided why not, and I'll try anything. Okay. Sometimes I have trouble believing some of it. I mean, I know my parents don't believe all that miracle stuff. But sometimes I get to reading it and I just kind of hope it's true, you know? There's, um, there, there's a story in, in the New Testament about about a man who tells Jesus he believes. 
And in the very next sentence, he asks him to help his unbelief. There's nothing wrong with a good, honest doubt. What matters is what you do with them. Okay, some uh, other resources. This organization, the Christian Medical Dental Associations, has a lot of things going on. As I mentioned, they put out a periodical, I think it's four times a year, articles to stimulate thought. Um, that's the website. And then uh, meeting with other healthcare practitioners that share the same goal. Two days ago, I had breakfast with uh, a chiropractor, two OBGYNs, orthopedic surgeon, and we're just talking about issues regarding how our faith can more influence our practices. So it's a good chance to meet with other people of like mind and consider what has gone well, what hasn't. Um, and you know, here we are talking about some of the ways that the Lord has blessed in this regard. But anybody who takes this challenge seriously of integrating the spiritual with the physical knows that it's, it can be intimidating. Uh, there's a certain anxiety there at times. Uh, fear of rejection? Most definitely. Most definitely. And so it is the kind of thing where having others to help build our faith, uh, to encourage one another in this regard, is going to enable us to uh, be stronger in our witness. But I'll just mention one final thing here. Um, the week I spent in Nigeria was with a ministry in Joss, Nigeria, where all the violence has been the last year and a half. It was right before that violence started. It was seen as a safe area when I went there. And I was with a group of about 16 men and their families that sought to share the gospel with those who would kill them because they were trying to do just that. Their goal, their target audience was Muslims who were, many of whom were hostile towards the gospel. And they're at their risk in their lives. And I had a worship service with them one Sunday morning that was the most joy-filled worship service I think I've ever been a part of. And I guess I want to take two things from that. One is, we're not risking our lives in this country to share the gospel. People may think less of us, but come on. I mean, you know, who are we trying to please and how much good is other people's admiration, you know? And the second thing is, how often do we miss out on the joy that God has for us because we're afraid to, to step out in faith in whatever God, however God might call us to do that? We want to stay in our safe environment and we miss out on seeing God at work. So perhaps those can be encouragements to do what it's sometimes hard to do, which is communicate our faith in word and deed to our, our patients. Okay, one final resource. Again, it's on your CD. I put together a little pamphlet called Dental Health, Spiritual Health. And I grabbed my life verse. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Okay, maybe that's not what you're saying. <laughs> okay. but, um, but, but, but the context of the pamphlet, the six-panel pamphlet, can be applied to almost any form of health care. It includes information about dental health and information about spiritual health. So feel free to use what you like, revise it to fit what you do, and, and change whatever you want to change if that can be handy. That's something that you can just hand a patient on their way out the door, and they can consider it or not consider it in their own, in their own time. I think we may have a minute or two for questions. Was there anything else? Audio. One more. One more slide. Okay. Any questions at all about anything we've talked about so far? Holy cow, we finished four minutes early. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all for being here. Thanks for coming. We want to thank you. So thank you so much. You. And we'd really like you all to take an opportunity to fill out these evaluations and give them back uh -oh. to me. That would be wonderful. Thank you.